Jeremiah Scott Jr., also known as Jerry Scott. J-E-R-E-M-I-A-H, Scott, S-C-O-T-T. -T. Do you prefer for the um, purposes of the film to um, have us subtitle your name Jeremiah or Jerry? Why don't you do on the subtitle Jeremiah Scott Jeremiah Jr. Scott. Okay. Right, and you can call me Jerry okay. in this interview. Okay, great. Um, and just one of the things you should also know is that we're going to take me out of this. So when you answer the questions, if you could answer them in complete sentences, right? Um, just because nobody will hear what the question is. Okay. Okay. And then, um, yeah, I think that I think that pretty well covers it. And so we've we've started with the easy thing. The nice thing about doing digital video too is that um, if you have to cough or clear your throat, you can just start the sentence over again mm -hmm. because um, that you know it's very easy just to take things out of. The, um, the video so don't worry like right now they're rolling I'm talking and blah 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 but we're gonna take all of that out of the video so um, how old were you during the 1964 flood I was 27 years old uh -huh. and, and what, what were you what were you doing for a living during that time well I graduated from Eureka High School in 1954 and I went to college and while attending college, I took Army ROTC. In those days, all young, healthy males were required to register for the Selective Service draft, and, and uh, I desired to be an officer because I was facing military service, so I took Army ROTC in college for four years, four-year cadetship. And when I was graduated from college in 1958, I was commissioned as a second lieutenant Army Infantry, and I went on active duty after college, and my first station was Fort Benning, Georgia at the famous Army Infantry School, where I attended what's called the Basic Infantry Officers Leadership Course, a 12-week course of second lieutenants teaching you how to be a platoon leader. A rifle platoon in the Army Infantry was 45 men five sergeants, uh, 45 riflemen, and five sergeants, and the platoon leader, who's normally a second lieutenant. After completing that course at Fort Benning, Georgia, I was stationed at Fort Riley, Kansas, uh, in the 1st Infantry Division, the Big Red One, that went ashore at Normandy Beach in 19, June 1944. Uh, with the Big Red One, I was the platoon leader of a platoon of 45 riflemen, when I made first lieutenant, uh, after about a year plus, I went to Fort Ord, California, where I trained troops, raw recruits right off the streets, uh, and uh, we had what's called basic uh, uh, training and advanced training each six weeks uh, course. And then uh, I was a first lieutenant. After two years, I got out of the Army and went to law school. I uh, got out of law school in 1963, and upon passing the bar in early 1964, I came back to Eureka, and, pr and I was practicing law in Eureka. While in law school from uh, 60 to 63 plus, I was in the 91st Infantry Division in San Jose, California, where I was a, a platoon leader and uh, executive officer of a rifle company. and. Uh, and I stayed in the reserve when I came back to Eureka. I, uh, uh, w I was assigned when I returned to Eureka to the 250th Transportation Company, which was located near Sequoia Park, across the street of Sequoia Park, where we see now the National Guard headquarters and the big facility there containing big trucks and tractors. At that time, in early 64, that location, across, the military location across from Sequoia Park was the National Guard, which was an engineer company, and the 250th Transportation Company. The 250th Transportation Company consisted of World War II amphibious ducks, which uh, people would see normally in movies. Uh, uh, they were assault transports for riflemen or troops onto the beach from uh, the vessels and they were manufactured uh, during the World War II. Uh, the amphibious duck was 50 to 31 feet long, 8 feet wide 
and were really a boat on a truck travis so that, uh, so that the duck could tr be transported by water. It had a propeller in the back, four big tires, and it could be uh, used uh, on land. So the, uh, during the invasion of Normandy Beach and the invasion in the islands in the South Pacific, the ducks were used to transport the men onto the beaches or onto the uh, uh, dry land, and then those uh, ducks would transport the men even on dry land. So I took over as company commander in 64 uh, of the amphibious duck company uh, at, uh, at Eureka. I was a captain, and I was infantry, so I was not familiar with amphibious ducks. My job as an infantryman was, was small unit tactics, rifles, uh, mortars, uh, and uh, machine guns, and not amphibious ducks. I never did learn how to drive one, but when I joined the reserve unit here in Eureka, I was 27 years old, and uh, we had approximately 150 men in the unit. And this is interesting because the men in the unit were in reserve. They had predominantly performed their active duty service in varying branches, anywhere from uh, chemical corps to, uh, to signal corps to transportation to artillery to armor. So we had uh, about 150 men, most of whom I knew uh, as uh, community members uh, as a young person. And, uh, and they had already done their active duty. So it was not like the regular army. It was kind of like fun and games. And, uh, uh, and, and so we had, uh, I was signed, I had to sign uh, my signature to be the custodian of 27 amphibious ducks. And we had nine located here in Eureka and the other 18 I think were uh, down in uh, near Mare Island uh, in the Bay, uh, San Francisco Bay Area. And, uh, and, and it required some expertise to, to drive those vehicles. So each vehicle had about three, a staff of three or four men who did certain jobs on the vehicle. And uh, so we would spend, uh, as a reserve unit, we were required to uh, spend one weekend a month uh, from uh, Friday to Sunday and then two weekdays, uh, two weekday nights. Uh, and then in the summertime, we would uh, go up to Fort Lewis, Washington for two weeks on the Puget Sound and uh, na navigate ducks that were up there. So uh, in December of 1964, uh, that was the status of the local reserve unit. They were local uh, uh, young men uh, in jobs here, lumber business, uh, uh, logging, uh, various jobs, and I had probably uh, one first lieutenant, Bill Sullivan, who had just come back from Korea, and probably two or three second lieutenants and about 150 men, sergeants and down to privates, and, uh, and they were just a great group of guys, and uh, so that was the uh, U.S. Army Reserve Unit then in Eureka. Also on the site was the uh, engineer company, which was a part of an engineer battalion, and they they were uh, actually that that engineer unit was uh, commanded by Warrant Officer Bob Brown, and they were used in the '64 flood, uh, uh, really with those uh, big pieces of equipment, the D6, D7 Caterpillar tractors and big trucks. Uh, in in restoring the the property uh, and the damage uh, after the 64, December sixty four flood, so they were a separate unit than mine. Okay, and so you know it started raining. It rained in November. Like at what point did you say, I think we've got a real serious situation here in Ure in in Humboldt County with the flooding? Well, I remember it very well. I, I remember the uh, 1954 flood. I was home from college as a freshman, and it rained heavily, and there was, a fl there was flooding along the Eel River that I remember, and the Klamath River, uh, and the Trinity River. And then I was here in, uh, it would be the 55 flood. I was here during the 54 December uh, earthquake, I remember that. 
but in December of 1964, I remember the incessant rain, day after day after day after rain, and, and I was not familiar with what the temperature or the snows were. We were just saying it was raining every day. I can't remember how many consecutive days, but I, I do recall people saying, oh, it's rained 10 or 15 or 17 or 19 straight days. Uh, but I do remember the, the heavy rain. Uh, and then uh, uh, I, think, uh, I think the high water mark of the Eel River was early morning, December 23. But I remember uh, maybe December 21, December 22, there were forecasts that there would be flooding at Fernbridge, flooding at Klamath, uh, and, and flooding at the other rivers. Uh, that, uh, I think the radio and television were announcing flooding was imminent, uh, probably the 21st or 22nd of December. And how did you um, find out that you were going to be called back up into service? Uh, on the morning of December 23, I was in my office uh, at 4th and E Street in Eureka, and I received a telephone call uh, from uh, the sergeant. Uh, there was an uh, active duty, uh, regular full-time sergeant at the reserve unit. I don't recall his name now, but he uh, called me and said that the Presidio of San Francisco, which was the 6th Army headquarters, called the reserve unit here on the telephone and indicated we are to go on active duty uh, to, uh, 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 to try to aid people during the flooding. The flooding had occurred, the high water mark had occurred early that morning, like two or three in the morning or one o'clock in the morning of the 23rd. And this was probably nine or 9.30, uh, the 23rd of December. Uh, I then got a call from the Presidio. Uh, uh, an officer identified himself. I don't remember his name nor rank, but he was probably a colonel, and he was stating that we are to go on active duty uh, to rescue and aid uh, people that were damaged or harmed by the flood. And so I, I then, uh, in talking with the sergeant uh, at the uh, Sequoia Park headquarters, I said to him, uh, we'll go out uh, in ducks, we'll take three ducks, always at a, three ducks together, so that if you, one duck is in trouble, there are two other ducks to aid the one duck, and uh, get 20 of the best drivers, and get, get them, uh, we didn't activate the entire unit, I said, uh, let's get, uh, let's rotate here, and we'll get 20 of the best men, best drivers, particularly sergeants, and those were generally sergeant uh, status, and uh, uh, report to the headquarters right away. So the sergeant then called the 2025 20, of the men, and uh, we went out that afternoon. I went home and got on my uniform and went up to Sequoia Park Military Headquarters, and we went out that afternoon, which would have been the 23rd. And now, a lot of these people must have lived in Eureka because um, already some of these areas were cut off from trans transportation from getting to Eureka. So a lot of your drivers lived in the Eureka area or were somewhere where they didn't well, the Well, uh, the, of, the, of the 150 men in the unit, I would estimate uh, uh, the vast majority lived in the Eureka Arcata area and Fortuna. And... Uh, Several were from uh, North uh, County would have been cut off, and, and several from South County were cut off, but predominantly they were in a, in a geographic area around the Humboldt Bay. Uh, so we had no problem getting people on board to help that were members of the unit. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, a lot of times you're concerned about your own family, but it sounds like it was a time where people said, you know, once they got their own family, you know, made sure everybody was safe, you know, they were all on board on helping um, to go rescue people. And yeah, ab absolutely. There was no, no dissension or apprehension or negative concept. Uh, I happened to live in southern uh, Eureka. Uh, we had a young son, maybe a year old, and uh, uh, we were high and dry, probably an elevation of 300 feet, so I wasn't worried about my family. But... Uh, uh, the people from uh, Fortuna were able to get in to Eureka 
but south of Fortuna, uh, negative. They were not able to get in, and, and Arcata people could get into Eureka. And so, um, was your job really kind of just commanding and uh, just making sure that everything ran smoothly, or did you actually go out and do some of the rescuing? Well, I went out with the ducks. Uh, uh, my, my main job was to uh, carry out the role that were, it was given to us from the headquarters of the Presidio to uh, rescue people, transport water, supplies, medical supplies, and blankets to the uh, area, uh, to the area affected. Uh, rescue people is the main, uh, so I actually went out. I was out, I went out with the ducks, uh, I think three days. And, uh, and then the ducks went out after that. When the water went down, uh, the immediate crisis was not as severe, let's say the fourth or fifth day. So I didn't go out, out in the ducks the fourth or fifth day. But I did uh, stay at the military headquarters uh, most of the day of each of the fourth and fifth day. But I was out in the flood area the first, second, and third day, being the 23rd, 24th, and 25th. Places did you go to, and what kind of happened on those days? Well, our first mission, uh, the Red Cross had set up, the United States Red Cross had set up uh, headquarters at Fortuna, at the Veterans Building on Main Street in Fortuna. Uh, I believe the Red Cross also set up the headquarters uh, at the Municipal Auditorium here in Eureka. Uh, and uh, uh, we were instructed to go to Fortuna, to the Red Cross headquarters, and uh, pick up uh, supplies. Our first, that first day, pick up supplies at Fortuna, water, and medicine, and go to uh, Riedel, Scotia. And so uh, we, we went out to Fortuna uh, and uh, we went into, or I went in with the, some sergeants and lieutenants and, into the, uh, the veterans building on Main Street. And it was set up as a command post and they were uh, set up. There are lots of cots and blankets and beds set up in, in the main floor of the veterans hall. And there were probably uh, dozens of people who had been in the flood uh, and were were uh, displaced by the flood, and they were actually a lot of children were in there uh, on the cots, and they were feeding those people. There was a, a food situation set up, and the dining hall, the mess hall set up, and they were feeding the people that were involved with the flooding. Uh, it was a, a real, uh, really well well organized. But I remember uh, uh, we were told we were told to take medicine and uh, blankets. And I think water to Ferndale. I mean to uh, Riadell, Scotia. Uh, and I was told that the the bridge at Riadell was out, so we'd have to go to Ferndale. So we then took the three ducks to the to Fern Bridge, and when we got on the high ground there on on 101, which is the present what I call the new 101, I could see just a mass of water. Uh, all I could see was water. And so we went to Fernbridge, and and I looked across uh, from what I could see on the east uh, entrance of Fernbridge, the bridge itself. I was concerned if I got on the other side, I couldn't turn around with that water on the on the west side of the bridge, and I was concerned for the for the safety of my troops uh, on the ducks because I didn't want to get into swift water. Those ducks were really not very navigable. Uh, and they, they could not navigate well in swift water. So I, uh, we stopped there at the uh, east side of the bridge at Bri uh, Fern Bridge, and I walked across the bridge, and I noticed just a couple things. There was a uh, piece of equipment on the bridge uh, trying to uh, dislocate logs and debris that had, uh, that had uh, gathered on the upstream portion of the bridge, causing pressure uh, to the bridge piers, and I, that's the first thing I noticed. And then when I got over to the, uh, the other side of the bridge, uh, uh, facing Fern Bridge, it was a mass of flooding water, 
and just on the incline on the west side of the bridge, I, I looked at the current. I walked down to the edge of the water and it was so swift I thought that there was a danger that if we got the ducks into that water we would lose the ducks and would end up in the Pacific Ocean and I'd lose people. And uh, that was my main concern is the safety of the troops. And so uh, I decided not to cross, not to cross uh, the Fern Bridge because of the water depth and, and the swiftness of the current uh, in the Eel River. So I went back to uh, the Red Cross uh, and told them that I was going to try to make it uh, to uh, Riedel, Scotia via 101. So we went, then went, uh, I think the next day, uh, the next day it got dark and I didn't want to be out in the dark. And so the next day, uh, we went down to Fortuna, uh, loaded up other material in the ducks, and I, we went south on 101, and, and it was a tremendous in the Alton area, Alton metropolitan area. Uh, water was high, uh, the, and Alton, particularly there's some, several pictures taken of the ducks at Alton, uh, but we weren't taking pictures. We were, we were rescuing people uh, and our mission that day was really to rescue people from the outlining areas, the agricultural areas at Metropolitan, Starvation Flat, uh, on the Van Dusen and uh, Alton. And so we, we did that, uh, and we did that for several hours, and we would bring people to, to dry land, and then they would be t uh, transported back to the Red Cross uh, Central Command Station there in Fortuna. Uh, I remember getting to uh, the area which was known as the Eel River Sawmills area, which would be south of Metropolitan, and, uh, and the whole entire mill of Eel River Sawmills, they had a big a coal deck of logs and then several, several hundreds of stacks of lumber were, were just taken out, and, and the, the swiftness of the river that high up uh, just destroyed the uh, lumber and the log uh, piles and were taking them into the main channel of the Eel River. And, and as we, we were on 101, probably a mile uh, north of Eel River sawmills, and it was solid water. Probably the water was four feet deep in that area, so we had to navigate with the propeller of the ducks and we got to the Eel River Sawmills area and I discovered the bridge was out. I saw that bridge that's famous in the pictures. I think it was the, the new bridge uh, was out uh, and maybe a portion of the what's called the Paul Mudgett Bridge. Uh, and so, uh, and this is kind of interesting, uh, I thought, well, maybe I can get to, to Scotia via the railroad. I, that was my thought. So we went uh, up a lane to the railroad, and, uh, and this would have been uh, in the vicinity of the Eel River Sawmills, uh, Sawmill. And I thought, well, if I get on that railroad and it's washed out, I, what am I gonna do? I better walk the railroad. So I did, in fact, uh, walk along that railroad, and I had three or four people with me, uh, a lieutenant and some sergeants, and we walked the railroad, and we didn't get very far, but the railroad was out uh, near, near the area where the bluffs, called the Scotia Bluffs. Uh, and so uh, uh, we decided we're not going to get to Scotia today. And so uh, uh, that was the second day. And then the third day, we, we stayed south of Eureka and, uh, and continued to go out and rescue people at Starvation Flat Metropolitan. Alton, and, and I do recall the, the, uh, the levee at Fortuna breaking early, and the Fortuna area all flooded south of Fortuna. When we went south of Fortuna, uh, the old highway went uh, along, I think they raised strawberries there now, just south of the, uh, and there was a couple sawmills there, and we, and we took the old route, but we had to navigate with propellers because of the depth of the water was, oh, four to six feet deep. Uh, so that's that's uh, generally where where we spent the third day, and that was the, then I came in and I stayed at the headquarters, and then we would rotate the men and officers uh, uh, daily 
uh, we rotated every day anyway, so that no one would be required to spend each day. So we had, we had, we had sufficient people to, to do that. That's good, yeah. Um, I'm wondering, um, just in my mind, I'm imagining these ducks and how, wondering how you get them from the, uh, the, the place by Sequoia, Sequoia Park to that location where, where um, you're putting them in the water. Do you walk them there like you'd walk a cat? Um, I mean, are you like driving them there, or do you load them on a trailer and move them? Okay, the the uh, the ducks are are self-sustaining. In other words, they they have four tires. They're just like a truck on a truck chassis on a boat. So you can drive them uh, on a highway. You can drive them up to speeds of 25, 30 miles an hour. And then when you hit the water, driving and the pe and the per personnel are on the ducks. Uh, you can uh, then uh, deflate from inside. You can deflate the tires so the tires are soft and they can navigate in the mud. And then when you get into high water, then you can turn on the propeller and it's just like being in a boat. Uh, and uh, so uh, they were self-sustaining. Did um, the, you know, Humboldt County silt is kind of well known for people getting their cars stuck in it. Did you have any problems with the ducks when you got into that kind of that in between where you have kind of liquid mud sort of thing with the ducks, or did they? No, to... no. the The ducks really were solid. Uh, uh, they're four wheel drive, or maybe six wheel drive. I can't remember four or six wheel drive, but they were able to nav navigate in any type of uh, silt or mud. And, and uh, we we were in, in coming up to houses, and people were. Uh, on porches or houses or in windows, uh, we'd get up pretty close, and uh, and sometimes we'd be in the mud. Sometimes we'd have to have the propeller going because it was so deep. The water was so deep. Do you remember any particular people that you rescued and what they what they said and how they reacted to seeing you guys? I mean, I'm sure that they were like so happy. <laughs> well, I can't remember names, but I remember uh, f dozens of faces, and particularly the, the mothers and the children. The, the, the fathers uh, and the males were very stoic about it. They were going about their business protecting their families, but the mothers were very attentive to their children, and the children were very happy to get into the ducks, and it was a new experience for those children to be in ducks, and of course it was a whole new experience for everybody, really. We had never been in that kind of situation before. Uh, but uh, the, the reaction of the people that we rescued from the uh, houses or high, uh, high locations uh, to take to safety uh, were very appreciative, and they expressed that appreciation. I, I, I want to mention a couple things uh, uh, with the people. Uh, the people had lost everything. Many of them lost everything. It was just amazing uh, uh, how uh, uh, tough those people were, losing everything, and all they have is the shirt on their back, and and especially people with uh, children with families. Uh, but uh, they persevered. And some of them lost everything twice because they'd lost everything in the 55 flood, and then they were losing everything again in the 65. Well, that's true. Uh, I, I might I might uh, bring one one area up, and that would be the community of Pepperwood. I remember as a child uh, uh, driving 101 Highway 101 went through right through Pepperwood, and there was a big swinging curve which still exists. And that 55 flood destroyed much of Pepperwood, uh, but the 64 flood was much greater and really destroyed Pepperwood. Totally destroyed Pepperwood. I think in 55, the road was restored in the same location. Many of the stores, motels, uh, were restored after the 55 flood, but not after the 64 flood. And there's several pictures of, of Pepperwood uh, after the 64 flood, aerial pictures, uh, showing uh, the total loss. And I think there were loss of life there in Pepperwood. Set five or seven people, I think, were, were lost their lives in the Pepperwood area. Uh, Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, you know, we're, I can't remember if you told me the story of the carved corn uh, statue from Pepperwood washing out. Oh yeah. Uh, w uh, w prior to 55, on that big curve uh, of Highway 101 in Pepperwood, there was a store called Pete. Pete Carnegie had, had uh, the store and a bar 
uh, in the same building, and I knew Pete Carnegie because my father was an attorney, and he was Pete Carnegie's attorney. And when I was 12, 13, 14 years old, my dad would stop and say hello to Pete and would buy produce. Uh, that 55 flood took out Pete's bar and and uh, uh, and the 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 corn uh, the area of Pepperwood was famous for corn and produce, and there were two or three wooden, uh, I guess you'd call them a wooden statue of a corn cob ready to eat. And, uh, and even if, if you go there now, there's one or two still standing on, on old Highway 101. Uh, but I remember a, a restaurant right on the street of the curve across from Pete Carnegie's uh, Pete's uh, store and bar. Uh, and they had, uh, they had, uh, uh, two statues, uh, I think, uh, or three statues. Uh, there was a famous uh, uh, comic strip uh, character called uh, Dagwood, Dag uh, or Dagwood and B Bumstead, or uh, it was the Bumstead family, or something like that. And and I think that's one of those statues still exists uh, in Pepperwood at one of the produce uh, stands and uh, to the north of the north of that. Uh, but uh, I remember uh, seeing or looking for those uh, uh, corn cobs. They're maybe six feet high, uh, sculptured uh, 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 and painted yellow and green, and they're still there. They're still the same ones are there. Did, did one of them get washed down the river? Or? Well, I think several got several washed down the river, but two or three were saved and still exist uh, at Pepperwood. Now, I had um, heard that, and I think you were the person who told me about Metropolitan, that the hotel at Metropolitan, um, sort of like a lot of the timber that came down the river backed up behind Metropolitan Hotel, which kind of uh, temporarily at least saved some of the people who were downriver of that. Did you tell me about that? Well, I, I became familiar, more familiar with Metropolitan because... Uh, the, the logs and lumber from the upstream mills, uh, Myers Flat Mill, Redcrest Mill, Pacific Lumber Company, Eel River Sawmills, much of the, the, the logs and lumber from those mills came downstream and were deposited along the, the shore of Eel River in the metropolitan area. And in the metropolitan area, then there was a, I think there was a, a Catholic monastery or uh, a sisters or priests were trained there or, or, uh, or studied there. And I think it may, may still exist, or I think that building still exists. It became a residence. I think the, the Bertain family later lived in that residence. Uh, but... Uh, in that area, all these logs and lumbers were deposited, uh, I mean, several feet high. Uh, and uh, I don't know if, they, if that really saved anybody downstream, but uh, it became uh, the subject of some litigation in court that my father and I were involved in later. Uh, the uh, Eel River Sawmills Company and Pacific Lumber Company claimed title to the uh, to the logs and lumber that were deposited on those ranches. And most of the ranchers uh, allowed uh, the com lumber companies to remove those. Uh, and the Corps of Engineers came up, uh, which was a regular army out of San Francisco, with equipment to, to clean uh, the ranches, clean the, the logs and lumber from those ranches. Uh, and we were involved with one ranch that the, the ranch owner wanted title to the logs and lumber, so there was litigation. And uh, the rancher that we represented ended up owning the logs and lumber. Uh, and uh, it was interesting because uh, the sheriff had to sell uh, the logs and lumber pursuant to the California statutes. And uh, the damage uh, caused to our client's uh, improvements uh, was his lien on the logs and lumber. And he got title to those logs and lumber. And he, he uh, used that, the logs and lumber, you bet. Seems like uh, a lot of. You oh, sure. Sorry, we have a technical thing when you sit forward. Um, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, you bet. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Oh, so you're actually hearing it. I'm hearing change when you move. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank okay. You. 
Um, so a lot of the people who have uh, dairy land out in the bottoms there um, were saying that, you know, um, one of the, you know, the, lo the, the timber came in and that was all stacked up, but also the amount of silt that came in and some of those properties had to be cleaned up. Do you know um, much about that? Well, I can remember two ranches losing a property, erosion caused by the, the swiftness and the height of the water. More erosion, the, the siltation is a fact of life with high water. Siltation is welcome because that makes the land more fertile. But erosion takes away what the land you have. And I remember a ranch, John and Ann Victoria on the Van Dusen, two or three weeks after the flood, uh, uh, they had a loss of uh, several acres on the Van Dusen of erosion. So that what used to be a field with crops or cows grazing was now a riverbed with rocks. And that also happened on the Miranda Ranch in uh, Ferndale and several other ranches. Many, numerous ranches uh, sustained that damage. Yeah, we also talked to people um, on the Klamath who had the same situation where they had homesteads up on the Klamath and lost um, their um, everything, the animals, the barns, the houses, um, and, you know, like acres and acres of property up on the Klamath as well. Well, uh, I can remember Klamath. Uh, I, I worked on a survey crew when I was in high school and college for in 53, 54, and 55. Uh, my dad thought every lawyer should know surveying, so I was on a survey crew at age 16. And we, we surveyed a lot of property up in the Klamath areas. So I was familiar with the community of Klamath in 53 and 54 having stayed there in the summertime in the motels and eating there in the, in the restaurants. And they had a movie theater in Klamath that changed the movie, I think, once a week. So I saw the movie a couple of times a week. But uh, what was really, Klamath was really damaged. Uh, there was a community, the Klamath area called, it was called Klamath Glen, was a residential community where people had beautiful homes, big, large homes, and there was a sawmill that I could, several sawmills in the Klamath area, but one in particular was called Arrow Mill, and I think Simpson bought out Arrow Mill ultimately. Uh, but uh, that mill was damaged, uh, and uh, the residential area of Klamath Glen was completely destroyed. The, the houses were just totally demolished in Klamath Glen. And the community of Klamath was, in 53, 54, was a large community. They had Oh gosh, several several motels, bars, restaurants, stores, and and that was uh, right by the bridge with the bear on the bridge or bears on the bridge. That community was truly destroyed. I did not go up there during the flood. We couldn't get up there. Oh, during the '64 flood, so you don't know um, during the '64 flood what sort of impact in the Klamath area. Well, I, I'm talking about the the impact that I observed after the flood, but I was not at Klamath during the flood. But after the flood, uh, I, I was there the following uh, summer working uh, again up on the survey crew and the, the entire community of Klamath was just destroyed by the 64 flood. And, and uh, the road was realigned, uh, the, the bridge was repaired and, and restored, but uh, Klamath was once a thriving community and no longer. I just want to clarify because you said after you were up there surveying after the 64 flood, but you mean the, 50, the 55 flood. Right? No, no. I, I did not serve during the flood uh, in uh, 64 at Klamath. We did not go north of, I don't think we went north of uh, McKinleyville or Trinidad in 64. I'm just going to check and see what else because when you and I talked on the phone, I made lots of notes. So I just want to see if there are other things. Um, oh, I think we've covered a lot of what we've talked about on the phone. Is there anything else about the flood that you feel like you want to talk about? About the 64 flood? 
Anything we well, uh, I, I would like to point out uh, after the, the flood, the bridges were taken out south. The, ma the main arteries, east, north, and south, the bridges were destroyed. And the first, the first bridge, uh, in my recollection, that was really repaired was the bridge between Riedel and Scotia. Uh, and with it, it was amazing, Caltrans got that bridge going quickly. And, uh, and there was uh, uh, the bridge just to the north of Riedel was also taken out. And that was restored. So the, the uh, automobiles and trucks were able to traverse 101. And I can't say a week or seven days or 10 days or two weeks later, but all of the 101 was basically a non uh, movable or non-traversable so that people use what was called the Bell Springs route. And the Bell Springs Road uh, takes off at Dyerville or if you went to Garberville you could go up on the Alder Point Road and get onto the Bell Springs Road. Uh, that road was originally called the Overland Trail and that was the first uh, route uh, land route getting into Eureka area, a uh, Humboldt Bay area, uh, until the railroad was put in in 1914. And so uh, that road originally was built probably in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. And that road comes out uh, in the area of uh, Leggett or Cummings, just north of Laytonville. And so that road was used primarily as the route uh, of traversing after the 64 flood, here we are in 1964, traversing a road that was built in 1880 called the Overland Road up on the ridge. And it, was, it held up. It's a smart place to put a road. <laughs> it, well, in those days, they put the road on the ridges because they couldn't build uh, on, along the rivers because of the trees and the, and the water imp impediment. Um, one of the things that um, we're, we were noticing as we go out and talk to different people and do different interviews, um, we, we kind of came up with this idea in our head that um, that maybe Humboldt County, Humboldt and Del Norte counties fared better than perhaps a, a large metropolis, you know, um, a major city might be because of the fact that people here, you know, a majority of the population work with their hands and are used to creative problem solving are, you know, they're either, if you're on a farm and you need a part, um, you may not be able to go into town to get the part. You're gonna have to figure out some way to make things work without it. Um, what do you think about that idea? I, I can't really comment uh, on that, uh, uh, comparing big city versus small city. I think the people of Humboldt County in those days, uh, especially were proficient. They were pioneers uh, and uh, it was rough country even then. Uh, electricity was not in every location. Uh, running water wasn't in every location. So that people were pretty independent. And the, the people that were in the lumber industry or logging industry were, were very independent. Uh, and with that uh, pioneer spirit, I think they were able to, to persevere in, in the tragedy of the flood. And I can't compare the big city because I, uh, I, I can't really compare that, their traits or character. But we were, uh, the, the people in this community were, were pretty solid. Yeah, and it seemed like people helped each other out. I mean, we've heard of people like who took in 50 people into their homes and, you know, uh, fed people and put them up until, you know, they could find, to get, you know, with family or, you know, somewhere else, get out of the county. Um, so it sounds like people really helped each other out during the flood. Well, there was a great deal of uh, goodwill uh, expressed uh, uh, overtly by people helping others b big time, especially people who were lost everything, uh, living in the, the lower areas there that lost everything. And, and there was a lot of charitable giving uh, by those uh, that had the ability to give and, and emotional giving and, and material giving. Um, in Eureka, um, what were the effects of the flood? We've talked to some people and just kind of asked, and some people have various recollections of kind of how it impacted people living in Eureka. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, uh, direct, I don't think there was any great direct relate, uh, effect or damage on the city of Eureka other than the lack of transportation 
north, south, and east. That that affected everybody. Uh, I think it affected uh, uh, sales of, of uh, sales or, or uh, transportation of items that people would use. Uh, we, we got behind by probably several weeks, several months, uh, but uh, no direct effect. We were high and dry in Eureka. Yeah. And did you notice the stores didn't have you know as much uh, choice on the shelves? That sort of thing? I can't recall. I, uh, uh, probably because my wife was doing the shopping. I can't recall that issue. Okay. And do you guys have any questions? Yeah, I want to ask two things, Jerry. So if you can keep looking at me when uh, Michael asks the question. Okay. If I come over here, it might help too. Um, it, it, we have seen several pictures of those ducks doing rescue work down at Alton. And uh, you said you were not involved with taking photos, but do you think those ducks are part of your team? Oh, they all they all are. The only ducks were the ducks in our reserve unit, oh. and I was the captain and company commander, and I was signed for those ducks. Had I lost one, uh, they'd be looking for me. Uh, oh, that's why I was good. very careful not to end up in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, no, those were our ducks, no, no other ducks. There was an aircraft carrier that was brought in and they had helicopters on the aircraft carrier right off the entrance of Humboldt Bay. And there were many helicopter uh, uh, activity, maybe about the third day. Interesting, uh, there were two helicopter crashes. One crash occurred on the main branch of the Eel River, just upstream from Dyerville. And, and even today, there are transport, uh, some kind of power lines or transportation lines going across the river and you'll see a big ball, an orange ball or a green ball, but apparently the, the helicopter that was traversing the Eel River upstream from Dyerville hit one of those wires and uh, I think uh, four or five, six people were killed, including uh, Bunny Hadley, who is a supervisor. Uh, and a well-known and well-respected uh, electrician in business here. Bunny was killed in that crash, uh, and, uh, and he was a spotter for the pilot of the helicopter. The pilots were regular, I think, regular uh, Army pilots, and, and, and I had on active duty. I was familiar with helicopters and riding in helicopters, and those helicopter pilots were, had great expertise. And Bunny was acting as a spotter because these pilots were not familiar with our terrain there and Bunny was acting as a spotter. Another helicopter crash occurred up near Trinidad and uh, I think eight or eleven people were killed there including some people who had been rescued by the helicopter. Uh, and all, all the occupants of that helicopter were killed with the helicopter crash there. Uh, but the, but the army, the regular army and the regular navy did a good job rescuing by helicopter. And the helicopter headquarters was off of uh, the McKinleyville Airport. And transportation of supplies came in by uh, airplane at the McKinleyville Airport. Uh, I gave a lecture on this flood uh, uh, at the Historical Society uh, lecture probably about four years ago, and. Uh, Two, two of the, one of the speakers, co-speakers, uh, Mr. Hill was a helicopter uh, uh, spotter, and the other speaker, uh, Fred was uh, later postmaster, uh, Fred uh, uh, indicated that they were bringing mail in and out uh, uh, by, by a uh, airplane, fixed wing plane. Yeah, we've, we've interviewed uh, Fred, Okay. <laughs> and um, we're going to uh, interview, I believe it's, is it Jim Hill? Oh yeah, Jim Hill, yeah. those two right. uh, were in, yeah. Yeah, we have Jim's yeah. contact information, we haven't lined that one up, right. yet, but that's on our list. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to ask also about the Bennington, you said it was parked out off the coast, uh, out, out of the mouth of the... Uh, well, the, the channel, the, the, cha ma the main interest channel of Humboldt Bay. Okay. Do you remember it being in Humboldt Bay? I do not remember seeing it in Humboldt Bay. Okay. I, I don't. I don't. I doubt. I don't. I, I doubt at that time. I don't think the channel entrance was big enough to handle a hill, a, a big a big carrier coming in. In fact, I, as the attorney for the Harbor District for thirty years, we had three projects deepening the bay, and if you look at, I have a picture 
in my uh, wall here of uh, not a picture but a diagram of the Corps of Engineers taking the the depths of the bay and the bay entrance and the bay entrance is only 8 or 10 12 feet deep in 1852 so uh, and that was the case uh, there was a, a, a little depth thing uh, deepening up until maybe 1895 but after 1895 there were several projects to deepen the base so that larger ships could get in. But I don't think a carrier could get in in 64.